Hello, hello. Welcome back to 25 Live at Home. This week, we are super excited to bring you kind of the back to school episode. This episode is all about different things at school, whether it be school anxiety, being yourself at school, or the different ways that we can support our kids and our students when they go to school. So we're going to start this week with our series, with our mini sermon and with our gospel text. So our gospel text this week is Mark 8, verses 27 to 38. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes into the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your word. We thank you that this week we have the opportunity to learn more about who Jesus really is in his own words. God, we pray that as we go through this back-to-school episode, we are thinking and praying for those teachers and those students and the administrators and all of the support staff and those retired and those also that are training to become someone that works with education and with the growth of our kids. And all God's people said, amen. So this week, my mini-sermon is titled, Who Am I? Who am I at school? Who am I at home? And who am I in the world? Who am I? In our scripture reading today, Jesus asked this very odd question to his disciples. It's almost like he's trying to play 20 questions without, the follow without following the rules. If he had been a rule follower, his disciples might have asked yes or no questions like, Are you someone who can cast out demons? Are you someone who can walk on water? Are you someone who can perform miracles? Are you the son of God? Of course, the game 20 questions wouldn't be invented for another thousand plus years, but the disciples felt like they were beating around the bush until finally Peter, of all people, hits it on the nose. You are the Messiah. Now in this back to school season, it has me thinking that Jesus as a teacher would have had a rather strange response. Most of us as teachers, when students answer a question, we get really excited when that student gets that right answer. But Jesus doesn't get excited. Instead of being excited about the pupil with the correct answer, he orders him to secrecy. Now, part of it might have been that Jesus wasn't quite ready for the whole world to know who he was, but I've got another feeling, a feeling that Christ wants people to discover who he is for themselves. Think about how much more powerful it is when you learn something by yourself, when you learn it by trying, by experimenting, by testing, versus when someone just tells you. I think the same thing holds true to Jesus. It's so much more powerful discovering Jesus and getting him to know on a personal level than to have somebody just tell you about him. Here's an example that I think of. Think of those of you who are in school right now, or maybe have been in school, if you have a sibling that's older than you, how often do teachers look at you and go, oh, you're so-and-so's sibling, or oh, you're so-and-so's little brother or little sister? 
it brings up a set of preconceived notions or ideas that that teacher has. Things like, oh, your sibling was a great student, so you better be too. Or, oh, your sibling was just a lot of, he was a tough one. Or they were very tricky. They were the class clown. You hopefully aren't a goofball too. I almost wonder if that's a little bit of what Christ is feeling here. He wants the opportunity for other people to discover who he is without them bringing these prior assumptions. Think about it. If the disciples had ran around and told a bunch of people, hey, Jesus is the Messiah, he's going to save us all. Every time he walked into a place, he would have been swamped and never had the chance to teach as he tried to get through the crowds. He wants the opportunity for other people to discover who he is. Just like the disciples had to. Some of the disciples called him out as John the Baptist, Elijah, or one of the other prophets. These disciples didn't know the answer either until Peter gave them the answer. And it makes me wonder, what did Jesus think of all this? Was he flattered? Was he insulted? It makes me think how we, how we treat kids during this back-to-school season. What expectations do we put on them to be the people we want them to be? What are we showing them about how to become the people that they will grow up to be in our society? For kids, have you talked to parents and teachers about who you are? What things do you find important about yourself? How do you make school a place where yourself and other people can belong? Jesus tells us that whoever wishes to follow him must deny themselves and follow him. But I'm not sure that means that we completely get rid of who we are. It's a bit more complicated than that. For parents, it might mean that they have to deny some of the hopes that they have for a child, whether that be getting an athletic scholarship, being the lead in the musical. If that's not what a kid wants to do, you might have to deny that wish of yourself. For kids, it might require that we deny the idea that we have all the answers. As much as kids like to roll their eyes at mom and dad or at whoever's at home, it can be tough to not or to admit that you don't have all the answers and that it might pay off to listen to somebody else. It's okay to ask for help. You're not a finished person yet. I think that the denial of self in the eyes of Christ is more about losing the idea that we can plan and design the perfect life. Instead, it's about surrendering the, to the fact that we as Christians are called to be caring, compassionate, and to show that the kingdom of God is a radically inclusive place where all are welcome and accepted for who they are. We are created in his image after all. God wouldn't want us to totally deny all aspects of what he so perfectly made. No, he merely asks us to think about how we might give up a little control and have a little faith that everything will be all right in the end when we trust in Christ. It's a hard thing in our schools and in our society today. So many people want to tell others the way it should be. They want to, you know, tell other people that you've got to act this way. You need to learn this way. Don't read that book. Or don't act like that. You need to follow this TikTok trend. But that's not the idea that Christ is calling us to do here. He wants us to lose our own life in order that we might gain the whole world. How powerful would it be if we truly let our own left our own plans at the door and gave Christ control? But how do we do that? I'm extremely grateful to my own parents because... They made it very clear what they wanted me to do and what they wanted my sisters to do. They told us three kids, at the end of the day, be a good person. Very simple. I think that's very much what Jesus calls us to do. Be a good person to one another. Love and trust in him. There was no, you have to do this or you won't be successful unless you... It freed us up to be clear of anxiety and so much of the worry that kids have today. And I'm so very thankful. So maybe, just maybe, we can take a note from Peter and be happy that we have the answers to who Christ is. But we can remember that having the answer isn't the point. Having total control and expectations aren't the point. But instead, the point is how we follow Christ and how we deny ourselves from that idea of perfect control 
and live into Christ's wishes of being kind and compassionate and inclusive to others. Amen. Hello, and welcome to our third installation of our 25 Live at Home web series. Um, today, we are welcoming Miss Allie Canagator, um, who you all may know as um, Harper and Ella's mom, yep. but I'll let her introduce herself. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about back to school transitions and uh, what it's like going back to school, some of the challenges and exciting things that we face. So I'm going to start by sending it to you and having you sure. just say a little bit about yourself. Yeah, um, I'm Allie Hanagator. I um, have two daughters here uh, that participate in all of our children's activities, Harper and Ella. Um, I've been a teacher for 12 years now. I've taught fifth grade and third grade and reading and math interventions. So I have a lot of um, teacher experience. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Well, welcome. It's good to have Thank you here. You. <laughs> All right. So we'll just get started. Um, one of the things as kids are going back to school um, is they kind of maybe see some new friends at school that they didn't see before. Um, and they might be wondering, you know, how can I get to know this person? So how... What are some um, ideas you might have for how you can be a friend to a new student, um, especially yeah. if they're looking kind of lonely or confused? Sure. Um, I'm a firm believer in a smile and a wave go a long way. Um, so just being a friendly face I think is really important, um, especially if it's a student who is new to the community or does not have other friends at school. Um, inviting them to play with you or taking your friends to play with them um, could be very beneficial. Um, but yeah, just a, a warm smile, a warm face, I think goes a long way for kids. Yeah. And as a parent of children myself, yeah. as a parent of children myself, one of the things that we have discussed at home is how they should respond when a classmate is acting up yeah. or when they have special needs that may cause them to have outbursts or things like yeah. this. I like to think of it as um, some things that are easy for me might be harder for one of you, whereas some things that are harder for one of you might be easier for me. So sitting still, listening, following directions isn't always easy for everyone. Um, just like my 12's multiplication facts might be okay for me, but maybe that's really tough for you. Um, so kids, like adults, are always fighting a battle that we may not know they're fighting, right? So understanding that, you know, that behavior, maybe they're not trying to purposefully be that way, but there's there's probably something that's causing that that maybe we just don't understand. Right. We like to say that they're having trouble with something. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So that yeah. kind of makes it feel more personal. That yeah, way. it does. Um, so kind of in a similar way, if you see a classmate having a bad day, how are some ways that you might offer to help them? Yeah, I think offering to help is beneficial. Um, Again, just letting somebody know that like you're there, even if you're not their best friend, maybe offering to help them with work or clean up something or play or um, just a nice conversation um, is worth it. I know when I'm having a bad day, being able to talk to somebody about that um, is beneficial. Maybe also having the opportunity to talk about something good that's happened in the day or maybe you recognize that friend that's having a hard day has done something good or, or has something good going for them and bringing that up could help them to remember that um, even though their day may not feel great, there are other things that are good about it. And how, how would you encourage your child or your girls <laughs> um, or just any student to um, be a friend to a friend who is sick? or not feeling well at school. Yeah, that's we get a lot of those friends. Things go around a lot at school. <laughs> even a boo-boo uh, that yeah, they have I'll, at recess, yeah, anything like that. Yeah, uh, maybe even just something as simple as like, you're like, Kurtz, can I grab the paper that the teacher's handing out for you? Or do you want some help getting your milk at lunch? Um, or hey, it looks like maybe you don't 
aren't able to play tag at recess today. Can we find something a little bit more low key that we can do on the playground or sit um, and play a game together, tell a story, something of that sort. Maybe adapting what you would normally do um, to help that friend so that they're able to feel included um, in something else. Good advice. Um, so for those of you who are in church this week or watch church on, on YouTube, um, in the scripture lesson today, Jesus told his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah, which is kind of interesting. Um, so that led me to think of, um, you know, issues in school about like, what might you do if you hear others are gossiping or spreading rumors about other children, even if you think they might be true? Yeah. There's some things. Um, I know it doesn't make me feel good um, to hear other people or to even think that other people might be saying negative things. I think a lot of people feel that way. Um, so remembering that if it, if it would hurt you or it would make you uncomfortable, it's probably not fair or kind to do to somebody else. Um, so just maybe putting those, those rumors to rest or just kind of not thinking about them, not, not continuing them on would be helpful. I think those, those are the kind of words that can really hurt people. Um, whether they are true or not, it's not necessarily our job to spread those types of things. And as parents are just, Here's an example, like your child comes home from school and they start to tell you about an incident in the yeah. classroom or on the yeah. playground. Yeah. How as parents can we best communicate with teachers and find out what really happened? Because yeah. sometimes stories are, yeah. you know, one side versus the yeah. other, blown out of proportion yeah. or just completely misread altogether. Absolutely. Um, what's the best way for parents to yeah. approach these situations when, especially because kids come home and they're yeah. high emotion because oh, they yeah. held it in yeah. and now you're feeling their emotion too and you want to oh, just yeah. fix it. Yeah. Um, I think one of the most important things to remember is 99% of teachers want what's best for your child. Um, and 99% of teachers are more than willing to help the situation. Um, we have like kind of like mom eyes, but they're teacher eyes. So we see a lot of things, but we don't see all of the things. That's, it's impossible. Um, so having open communication with a teacher is really important. Um, understanding that, um, take everything with a grain of salt. Um, our perspective might be a little bit off. So your child's perspective of the event could be feel very real in their eyes, um, but the perspective from a different child or from a teacher could also be something to consider as well. So just open communication is really important, I think. And and like I said, 99% of teachers are, are looking to help kids. They're looking to make them feel comfortable um, and work through issues. That's part of um, what we do as a teacher is, is helping kids with social situations and learning how to handle social situations. And so sometimes we need, um, we need to know what your child is telling you in order to be able to, to really do those things. Um, and something that I've always wondered, I kind of got a little taste of it working here in children's and family ministry, <laughs> but what is unique about being both a teacher and a parent? Um, how do you navigate that? Uh, it's, it can be tough. Um, I think I have a higher um, expectation or standard um, for what my girls do, especially at school, than maybe an average parent would, just because I know what it should what ideally it would look like, not even what it should like, like, but what it would ideally look like. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of understanding of like the academic piece, the social piece, the behavior piece. And so um, I want my kids to do really well. And so I feel like I expect that. Um, sometimes I have to remind myself that they are kids and all yeah. kids are, you know, going to miss the mark a little bit from here and there. <laughs> but um it's also really fun to be able to like have some of those conversations and, mm -hmm. and talk about some of the academics and how they connect to other things um, that maybe other parents who don't spend a day in school um, may not know or may not know is, is happening in a classroom. So mm -hmm. there's, there's pluses and minuses to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we thank you for being with us today yeah, and course. for helping us to 
share with our kids the best way yeah. that they can be their best. I, Lily used to go to Borlaug and yeah. there's, their saying was to be your Borlaug best and then yeah. they would bark afterwards. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you very much yeah. for sharing with of us course. today. Thank you for having me.